Um, thanks for being here today. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, my research uh, that I started working on about a year back when I joined UCLA. Um, and uh, it's titled A Reproductive Wear Has a Central Position in Multilayer Social Networks of Primitively Used Social Paper Walls. Uh, I know that's very wordy, but hopefully you'll understand what this means by the end of my talk today. Uh, so these are uh, the same species that I worked on for my PhD, but um, I dived into uh, multilayer social networks rather recently. Um, so I'd love for any suggestions you all have today. Okay, so beginning um, my talk, I'd first like to uh, come to the same page about social status, because that's what I'm going to talk about uh, often. So social status, both in humans and animals, is nothing but the perceived or the actual social value relative to other individuals in the colony or in a society. So um, in general, for any hierarchy, uh, individuals that are higher in the hierarchy have a greater fitness benefit, which means um, that they leave behind more offsprings than the others. Now, there's various factors that can determine social status. Um, you know, this could vary from, for example, in spotted hyenas, it is the more aggressive females that leave behind uh, more offspring. And now, uh, reproductive success in this species was measured as the number of offspring that actually grew up to reproductive maturity. Uh, so it was aggression that determined this success. On the other hand, in gopher tortoises, it is the larger males that sire more offspring than the smaller uh, males. In another butterfly, which is Bicyclis aninana, it is in fact the older males that have a higher mating success. And this is irrespective of their body size. Also, in some social groups, even the spatial location of individuals can influence their mating success. For example, in Japanese macaques that have uh, bisexual groups with both males and females in the group, generally the males that are closer to the center have a higher social status. However, when there's fewer females in their groups, it's actually beneficial to be at the periphery because that allows them to actually meet with, sneak and mate with females from the neighboring groups. So basically spatial position in a group can determine mating strategies that are adopted as well as the mating success in this species. Uh, similar hierarchies are also seen in social insect colonies, which include wasps, basically social wasps, bumblebees, honeybees, and ants. Now, these hierarchies are slightly more reproductive in nature. What I mean is that in social insect colonies, there's only a few individuals that have uh, the chance to reproduce. So there's reproductive division of labor, not, not everybody reproduces. Uh, in some primitively used social societies, a reproductive can often be replaced by another individual leading to a reproductive hierarchy that's pretty linear. Now by primitively used social societies, I mean societies where you cannot morphologically differentiate between the reproductive and the worker. So basically the workers may also be physiologically capable of reproducing, but do not because they're suppressed either aggressively or chemically. Now the reproductive hierarchies in most social insects can either be determined by age, which means that the oldest individual um, in the colony be becomes the next reproductive or social interactions like dominance interactions such that the most dominant individual becomes the next uh, reproductive or you know, physiology, basically any uh, individual who has developed ovaries um, or has mated may get a chance to be the new reproductive. This brings me uh, to my study species, which was Ropalidia marginata. Now, Ropalidia marginata is a tropical, primitively used social paper wasp. As I said, primitively used social means that the queen and the workers just look the same. 
you can just look at them and identify who the queen is. Um, there's a single docile queen at any given time in these colonies, and she can only be identified by her egg laying behavior. Now, as I mentioned, uh, she's docile, which, is, which means that she is non-aggressive. So how does she suppress other workers who are physiologically capable of reproducing uh, and prevent them from reproducing when she's there in the colony? So what she does is that she uses her pheromones to suppress worker reproduction. And here's a, a video of what that looks like. So basically at the bottom, if you see, there's one individual who is constantly rubbing her abdomen on the nest surface. And she's basically uh, sending this chemical signal that she's still fertile and it's an honest signal of her fertility. And you know, she's the queen of the colony. Um, so when this queen dies, what happens is that one of the workers actually replaces her and we call this worker a potential queen. Uh, and from this species, we know that there's a, a hierarchy that's rather linear up to at least five potential queens. And there could be more uh, of these. Now, what's interesting about this species is that unlike other social insects, the potential queen cannot be identified as long as the queen is present in the colony. So she's neither the oldest, nor the most dominant, nor the biggest or a mated female necessarily. <clears throat> so interestingly, what happens that even if the queen is experimentally removed from the colony, one of the workers becomes hyper aggressive, like shows like tenfold more aggression towards her colony members after the queen dies or is removed. And she remains unchallenged. So she keeps beating up everybody else, but nobody beats her back. And after a week, she again starts losing this dom uh, aggression and starts laying eggs as a new docile queen of the colony. Now, uh, as I said, we don't know uh, as long as the queen is present so far, what determines uh, who the PQ is going to be, who the heir is going to be. Now, we have to remember that in complex societies, uh, social status might not actually be de determined by a single uh, factor. For example, just uh, looking at this cartoon, what do you look at? Do you look at the height of the, these individuals or the size of their antlers? So basically for these complex societies, it might be worthwhile to not look along a single axis to look for factors determining social status but looking at multiple social contexts. That's especially uh, for these colonies of paper wasps, for example, they show a myriad of complex behaviors. For example, dominant and subordinate interactions, feeding larvae, foraging, food exchange, sitting and grooming themselves, maintaining nests, scraping cells and rebuilding them, or spatial overlap. Now, while most of these things can be visually uh, observed behaviorally, spatial overlap is something that I calculate and I'm going to talk more about it in my subsequent slides. So this brings me to the uh, overall question, the research question I was interested in addressing. Was it possible to identify the potential queen in Dropalidia marginata colonies based on multiple social scenarios as so far they have not been identified by any single social scenario? So um, the lab that I used to uh, work in, uh, my PhD lab back in India, has been working on this same species for more than three decades now. And uh, we've, we've found out what doesn't determine who the potential queen is, but we still don't know how to identify a single individual who's going to replace the queen in the future, as long as the queen is still in the colony. So do we need uh, complex multilayer networks to account for the complex behavioral repertoire of this species. But why multilayer social networks? So traditional networks have, uh, as many of you would know, can help us identify very well-connected individuals in any group. But there's a major flaw with traditional networks which is that different kinds of interactions are often clubbed together as though they were the same. And this leads to a loss of rich, complex information that's available. 
So multi-layer networks basically provide a novel analytical approach to integrate information from multiple sources and representing them as individual layers in a multi-layered network, basically different contexts in which individuals may interact. Uh, so one of the papers by D. Domenico et al. in 2014 puts it uh, rather well, which is that centrality measures. So centrality measures are nothing but how connected individuals are. Uh, they might actually overlook nodes or uh, individuals that are not important in one social situation, but are important in another. So the versatility of nodes, which is nothing but how connected they are in a multi-layer uh, scenario, is used to identify central nodes while accounting for their connectedness across many social situations. So this is why we need, we thought of uh, using multi-layer social network approach for addressing this question. Now, the specific question that first came up was, what, was it that individuals are even interacting with each other with differing likelihoods? Uh, or was it that all individuals interacted with everybody to the same extent? The second question was that which of these social situations were actually more important in determining the social structure of the colony overall? And finally, could we identify the potential queen in the presence of the queen based on her position in the multi-layered social network of the colony? For answering these questions, what I did was I brought five colonies of Ropalidia marginata into a vespiri. Now these vesperies do not have closed windows, but have mesh, which is small enough uh, to prevent predators from coming in, but uh, big enough for these individuals to go out on their own and hunt uh, for prey. So these individuals basically uh, hunt caterpillars, etc., and bring them back as bullae of food. Uh, each of these colonies was video recorded for three consecutive days from eight in the morning to six in the evening. And using these 30 hours of data, I collected first the spatial data, which involved me manually tracking each wasp uh, every six minutes in, the, in this 30 hour long video, and then creating what are called core areas. Uh, for sim simplicity, you can remember that core areas are nothing but areas that were used more intensively uh, as compared to the rest of the nest by an individual. And then once I had these core areas, I calculated something called spatial overlap between all pairs of work in each colony. And I'm gonna explain how I calculated that in the next slide. Uh, in addition, I also uh, subsetted all my behavioral uh, information to only dyadic behavioral data, basically adult-adult interactions, which involved dominant subordinate interactions, solid food exchange, and trophallaxis. So trophallaxis is nothing but nutritional exchange of liquid material instead of the solid material. So as I mentioned, spatial overlap, once I have the core areas of all the wasps delineated, what I calculated was the proportion of one worker's core area that was overlapped by the other. Now, uh, a thing to remember is that this is not a directional layer uh, because the proportion of wasp a score area that is overlapped by wasp B might actually be different from the proportion of wasp B score area that is overlapped by wasp A. Now that I had this spatial overlap layer, I used my behavioral data to uh, create the three other layers in my multi-layer network. And uh, just to specify, all these behavioral um, layers were created based on the frequency per hour of uh, these behaviors that I'm going to show you in these uh, videos. And uh, what I calculated was how often they interacted and with whom. So for example, this is how aggression uh, looks like in such colonies. So like here, you see that there's an aggressor who starts biting the wing of another uh, wasp uh, out of the blue and uh, the direction again is very clear because one of them starts beating the other one up and the other uh, one that's getting suppressed starts cowering down and submitting to the aggressor. Uh, as I mentioned, these individuals hunt uh, caterpillars and bring them back as bullae and 
uh, another layer that I created was the solid food exchange layer, which was nothing but uh, also directional, such that one of the individuals brought food and the other one uh, shared it from the first individual. The fourth and final layer of my multi-layer network was created from the behavior trophallaxis, where you see a pair of wasps locking their mandibles to exchange liquid nutrition. So this was the fourth multi-layer, uh, fourth layer in my multi-layer network. And I created these uh, multi-layer networks using MuxWiz, which is basically um, a software that can be used with R. And this is an example of how my multi-layer network looked for one of the colonies. Here, each layer uh, is shown in a gray background. Each node is basically a single wasp. And as you can see, not all wasps interacted in all social situations. The black edges basically connect individuals that interacted in that particular uh, social situation. And the gray lines are interlayer edges that connect the same individual across social situations. The darker nodes are basically the ones that are more well connected uh, to the others. Now, uh, I calculated two measures, which were out degree first, which means the total number of edges that were pointing out of a node. And this measures uh, the number of individuals a wasp initiated interactions with. Another measure was out strength. Uh, and this measures the intensity of these interactions uh, and provides information on how much of a behavior an individual initiated. Now, centrality is the term that's generally used in traditional networks or single layer networks or aggregate networks, while versatility is the counterpart term uh, for multi-layer networks. So to address my specific questions, the first question, like I mentioned, was to see if there was a variation in interactions between individuals. And to answer this, I uh, plotted the degree distribution of individuals, both in multi-layer network and aggregate network. And here the x-axis is the out degree, uh, which has been standardized by dividing by the number of uh, wasps in a colony because that varied. And here you can see that the multi-layer multi network basically captures the variation in interactions due to different social situations. While in the aggregate network, it seems like everybody is interacting with everybody else because all the social situations have been contracted into a single aggregate network. So now uh, that I found that there was some variation in interactions, that was being captured in multi-layer networks going to the different social situations. The next question uh, I tried to address was the differences in the importance of the social situations in my multi-layer network. For this, I calculated something called information quality, which allows the identification of redundant layers in a multi-layer network. Now the process of identifying redundancy is basically by comparing different combinations of layers with an aggregate network such that uh, the calculation of information loss from removing layers can be seen and then assessed if uh, there's a great difference um, in information by removing certain layers. So it's nothing but a trade-off between accuracy and complexity. Now, when I did this for all five colonies, I found that the information that was provided by the solid food exchange layer was probably redundant in all colonies. And this could be because it was the sparsest layer of my multi-layer network. Also, uh, the nutritional exchange information was captured already by the trophil access network, so that could be the other reason. Uh, additionally, the spatial layer uh, was the most informative and it was the densest layer, so it increased navigability. So navigability has been defined as uh, the average fraction of nodes a random walker would pass or encounter within a finite time in a network. Now, uh, also, the presence of a dense spatial layer might have reduced the chances of false negatives. For example, if I only looked at an aggress aggression scenario, maybe wasp A and wasp B did not interact aggressively, but it's still possible that their spatial overlap was uh, immense. So they were still connected. Um, 
another thing that uh, came up was that densely connected layers contributed more information in general than less dense ones. But that is not the only thing that mattered. Uh, turns out that unique interactions may outweigh density. For example, the trophal axis layer was, the, was denser consistently than the aggression layer, but the aggression layer was always more informative. Um, the final question that I was interested in uh, asking uh, was that, could we identify the potential queen in the presence of the queen based on her position in the multilayered social network of the colony? Indeed, I found that the potential queen was actually highly connected in multilayer networks of all uh, colonies. Actually, four, in four of the five colonies, she was the most connected individual, while in the fifth colony, she was the second most connected individual. This is evident uh, from this annular representation of our degree, where each ring is a different uh, network representation, the outermost being the multilayer network, and each slice, uh, which is uh, going from lightly colored to dark colored based on how connected this individual is, shows uh, one individual's out degree. And as you can see in the outermost ring, for example, the darkest color is for the PQ showing that she had the highest out degree on. She was the most well connected in this particular colony. A similar thing could be seen uh, in the annular representation of the out strength. Uh, and I'm sorry that the organization of the rings is not the same in A and B, but in B, the multilayer network is the third ring. And here again, the potential queen is the darkest slice, which means that she had the strongest connections uh, as compared to the other individuals in that colony. Now that I know that she was actually the most connected as well as the most strongly connected. I wanted to find out this, if this was happening just by chance. And what I did was that I took my multilayer network with each layer having the nodes that interacted in that social situation. Because like I said, that not everybody interacted in all social situations. And within each layer, I shuffled the node identities uh, for each randomization. And I randomized or shuffled uh, within a layer each uh, the nodes. And I did this a thousand times to create a reference distribution for both our degree and our strength of the PQ. And I found that the potential queens our degree and our strength was fatality in all five colonies was significantly higher than expected by chance alone. This you can see here in this violent plot where the black vertical lines are basically the 95% confidence intervals for each colony, different colors indicate different colonies. And the diamond uh, points are basically the observed out degree of that uh, colony's potential queen. And as you can see, it is significantly higher for both the out degree as well as the out strength in multilayer network. Now comparing this with the other uh, network representations, I found more interestingly that it was only in the multilayer network scenario where I could identify the potential queen clearly as having the uh, higher out degree and out strength as compared to the other. And this was not so obvious in other network representations like the aggregate network or just using the spatial overlap information or only using the aggression network or only using the trophal axis or solid food exchange network. And a similar observation was made by doing randomization using out strength instead of out degree. So uh, the key results from my study were that there was more variation that was captured in degree distribution in multilayer networks as compared to aggregate networks. The spatial overlap layer was most informative and has never been analyzed for Opalidia marginata before. Like I mentioned that so far we've looked at single social scenarios and uh, have not been able to identify the PQ in the presence of the queen uh, and even looked at aggregate networks, but without spatial overlap information. So this is the first time we're looking at spatial overlap. It actually turned out to be the most informative. Uh, 
Um, and I found that PQ was consistently identified in multilayer networks uh, to have an out degree versatility and out strength versatility that was higher than expected by chance. And interestingly, none of the layers independently or as an aggregate network were able to consistently identify the PQ in all nests. To conclude, multilayer networks seem to be more successful in identifying prominent individuals in a group than traditional network analysis, thus providing a more complete understanding of the complexities of social behavior. Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge the WASPs, Noah Pintervillman, uh, who's my present postdoc um, supervisor, and uh, Professor Raghavendra Gadakkar, who's been working on this species for more than three decades and with whom I did my PhD.